All right, welcome back everyone. So in this walkthrough, what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about data in the app, um, where it comes from, how it's used, and this will give us a chance to kind of trace a little bit of the flow of uh, how the data flows through our app from the backend server, from the file where it's stored through the backend server to the client and then onto the screen. Along the way, we will have a chance to potentially work on or notice one small problem with MP, uh, with the current MP, that'll earn you a few points on MP1. So um, let's go ahead and run the app. So I'm gonna run this uh, in my emulator. As usual, it's gonna take a minute to start up, uh, fire up the app. Um, and when this starts up, what we're going to see is that there is data that's visible to us. So I've, I've uh, put in the changes from um, MP0, so we're centered appropriately at the happy place. Um, and you can see that there are markers on the map. Now, one thing that we should notice here is that when I click on these, I see this empty info window, which is probably not what's intended. There's probably some information about this place that I should be able to see that I can't. Um, so, you know, whenever we do something like this, we can always kind of start in, in two different ways. We could start from the bottom and work up, or we can start from the top and work down. For now, let's start at the top and work down. So we'll talk about, first of all, where the data ends up. So the, you know, this app is designed to allow you to explore the favorite places of staff members and some faculty members in the Champaign-Urbana area. And once we fix today's bug, you'll actually be able to click on the place and learn a little bit more about it. And hopefully, particularly some of you that are new to the area can use this information to start exploring around Champaign-Urbana, find some new things to do, find out a little bit about the area. I found out some cool things about the area that I didn't know from some of the places that were contributed by our staff members and other faculty members in computer science, so kind of fun. Um, and you know, uh, on this map, I can zoom out a little bit. You know, somebody's favorite places all the way over here. Uh, someone's favorite places up here. This is somewhere in Urbana. You know, uh, we have some people with favorite places sort of somewhere in downtown Champaign. And, and again, right now we're sort of prevented from knowing anything more about these places because of this bug that we'll fix. Um, or, or we'll have a chance to fix. Uh, and we'll have to keep an eye out for where things are coming from. So the first thing to look at is sort of how did these um, places get on the map in the first place? And this is this method, and we talked about this a little bit when we were going through the main activity, called update shown places. <clears throat> and so both the client and the server here are using this model called place. And this is really just a standard Java class that we're gonna use to store information about a place on the map. And you can see that it has certain fields that we've already set up um, that represent the data that we're gonna store about every place. So every place has a unique ID. This is something that's done very frequently when we work with data to make sure that every data point has like some unique attribute. Um, and we could just, this is actually using a type of unique ID called a UUID. That's just something that we generate at random. It's just a big sort of random number you can think of it, or it has some letters in it as well, but it's just designed to make sure that this is different than any other similar um, unique ID generated anywhere on the planet. And so the idea is every data, every piece of data has this unique ID. Uh, it has a name. So that name is actually the name of the person who contributed that favorite place. It has a latitude and a longitude. We've been you know, preparing ourselves by working with location-based data. So this is a position on the earth. Um, that's what's being used to put these on to, into the right spot on the map. We'll look at that in a minute. And then it has a description. And that description is supposed to store the information that was provided by the person who contributed this favorite place about the place. Like, what's cool about it, right? Like, why would I want to go there? You know, what's interesting about that spot? Uh, and right now, that's sort of what's broken here is that those descriptions are missing in the UI. They're in the data set, but somewhere along the way, as the data travels from the server all the way up to our client application, those descriptions are getting lost. Um, okay. So let's look now, uh, let's go back to the main activity and we'll kind of look a little bit at this. So you'll see I'm going through this list of places. This helper method is passed a list of places. So everything in the list has those attributes and it's using the attributes to set a marker on the map. Now this is using this library called OSM Droid, which we're using for this project that allows us to render maps and do cool things like add markers to them. 
Um, so you'll see that it sets the position for each marker based on its latitude and longitude value. And that's why these end up in the right spot on the map, right? They end up where the uh, person originally placed them. Um, and then it also sets a title. Now this is a little confusing. It probably should be like a set description or something, but markers have a title, which is what's shown when I open this info window. And so we could put some logging in here, but what's happening is get description is blank. So some, again, somewhere along the way, you know, the description is being lost when, you know, before it gets to the UI. Okay, so I kind of talked about, you know, maybe we would go step by step, but let's actually zoom all the way down to the bottom and talk about where does the data come from? Like we gave you this data, but where is it? So if I go over to resources here, and again, I'm in the project view as I normally, uh, uh, as, as I normally am, uh, I see this file called places.csv. So let's open that up here. If you want to install this plugin, you can. It's not, not the end of the world. Um, but this is our data, right? This is the data that we're using. Now there's a couple of lines up here that, um, so this is a header for uh, the data set. This is a, a hash, which allows us to make sure that you didn't modify this when we run the test suites, because if you start changing this, like anything could happen and you're gonna get some strange results. But this is the data that's used to populate that map. Um, now, in a real application like this, this data would not be stored in a CSV file. It would be stored in a database or something like that. Um, some of you may be familiar with CSV. Some of you may not. But CSV is one way of what's called serializing data. So taking data and converting it into a string, which allows us to save it into a file and exchange it with each other. Right? So I gave you the data that you need to render this map by including the CSV file in your project. Now, what's the format of this? So you'll notice that there's a mapping between these fields and the fields on our place, um, our place class, right? So places.csv has an ID, a name, latitude, longitude, and description. Our place has an ID, a name, a latitude, longitude, and description. So essentially, we've modeled our place model, our class here, based on the data that we were given. Um, and so now the question becomes, how does the data get from this file into a place, right? Where, where is the code that does that? So the code that does that is part of the server. So we started at the very top, we went all the way down to the actual raw data, and now let's look at how that data is used by our server. So you'll notice that, and again, this is sort of a, a quick, you know, tracing through different things in the code to give us some sense of, of what's happening. In our server, there is a, a method that's called load places. Um, and this uh, returns a list of places. And um, this, actually this JSON processing exception probably doesn't even need to be here anymore. It's just sort of a, probably get rid of this if we want to. Uh, can we? Uh, oh, right, okay, yeah. And then do this. I'm gonna leave that there, that's okay. Um, this is actually a, an old piece of code that shouldn't have been there anymore and I'm tempted to clean it up, but I'm just gonna leave it alone. Um, all right, so let's walk through this. So this runs very, very early when your server starts up. Now, if you remember a little bit uh, about what we talked about previously, your app is divided into two parts. There's the server code that would normally run on another machine in the cloud, on a network server somewhere, and there's the client app that would run on your phone. We've bundled everything into one place to give you the experience of being able to modify everything and seeing how everything fits together, which is pretty exciting. Um, but what that means is that, you know, when we think about our application, even though it's all running together, we really do want to think about it as two separate pieces that are communicating with each other. There's the app, which is our client, and then there's the server, which is really primarily the code in server.java. So really server.java is the backend server, sometimes we would call it, and everything else is the client. So the activity, client.java. Um, we have a few things that are used in both places, like the models. Uh, like our place model is used both on the client and on the server. But in general, normally these would sort of be separate code bases that, you know, maybe the same team would work on or maybe two different teams would work on. Um, so the server is loading this list of places from this file. And this is this sort of a little bit of magic, and this is just sort of Java at its worst, I apologize for this, um, that we use to load the uh, file places.csv into a string. And so if I put like a, a print statement here, what I would see is that when I'm done, this input string contains places.csv, the whole file. Um, 
Then what we do is we're using a library to parse CSVs called, uh, what is the library called? It's imported up here, OpenCSV. Um, and so OpenCSV gives us some tools that simplify the process of taking CSV data in a string and converting it to a series of CSV records. Um, so we initialize the CSV reader class. You notice that we skip two lines in the data set. That takes us past this line, with this, which is this hash that we use to maintain the integrity of the file and the header. So those are two pieces that we don't want in the data. Those are really there for us as humans to be able to understand what's going on in here. Um, and then we actually start going through and we, uh, so the CSV reader returns a, a list of strings and we go through that string and we're, we're parsing um, that, that string array into each um, place object. So we're creating a new place. This is just using the place constructor and we're passing each, so each, um, each string array, sorry. So the CSV reader gives us back string arrays. Each index in that array corresponds to one piece of data that was separated by, by commas. So maybe, a, a, maybe a, this is the point at which we should put like a, um, you know, that's not going to print nicely because it's Java and it's array. Maybe we should put a little bit of a, of a piece of uh, instrumentation here. And now let's go to logcat, open things up, and we're going to look for uh, system that out. And you'll see what's being printed here are all the IDs. Because when we split, CSV has the field separated by commas. So when we split it up, the first one in each line is this ID. The second one, uh, so let's look at the second piece of data, that's going to be the name of the, the uh, staff member or faculty member who contributed that. So you see also Gunter, Colleen Lewis participated, I'm in there, uh, a bunch of people from our staff. Um, so that's neat. And then the next two things are uh, just as they appear in the CSV file. So there's a lot of latitude and longitude. These are all in the Champaign-Urbana area. And then there's the description. Um, the latitude and the longitude we need to pull out by using double parse double. We want to convert these into doubles but in the CSV file, they're all strings. So we do this here, and then we load the description. Okay, so what do we get out of this? We get a list of places. So what we've done here is something that's called deserialization. We've taken a string that contains data, and we've converted it into a collection of Java objects. In this case, a collection of place objects. That, so now the question is, where is this used uh, in our code? And where it's used is during startup. So essentially, during startup, we load, use this to load a list of places, and we save it in this places variable that is used, uh, that is part of the server class, which is right here. So this gets initialized during startup. Now, so we're on this journey. So now we see the server loads the data from the CSV file, has a list of places, but how does the data get to the client? Now here's where there's some really cool magic that happens. Because remember, normally the server is in one place. It's running on one machine in like a cloud data center somewhere, and the client is running on your phone. So now, you know, sometimes when you trace code, you can see how one method calls one method calls one method, and you can use that to understand how the code, how sort of execution is flowing between different parts of a program. But here there's gonna be a gap because there's communication that happens over the internet that enables the client to retrieve this data from the server. Because this server, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about MP2 and a little bit more about networking, but this server is running something called the HTTP protocol, which allows it to provide data over a standard protocol to the client. So the client, when it starts up, makes a request to the server and it says, hey, I know you've got some data for me. I'd like a list of all the favorite places contributed by all the different people uh, all the different staff members, um, you know, that participate in this project so that I can use that to render the UI. So it makes this request to the server. Where does that request come? That request comes right here to this dispatch method. And what happens is the request takes the form of asking for this particular URL, and you would recognize this. This looks like the things that you type into your browser when you're browsing the web, because it's actually using the exactly same protocol. The same protocol that we can use to retrieve web pages, we can also use to retrieve data. Um, and so what it's asking for is this places, um, 
It's asking for a, a list of places here. Uh, and what we do is we return the list of places. Now, the question is, how do we return a list of places? Because these are sort of like objects that are in memory. So now remember we did deserialization. We took that places.csv as a string and we converted it into uh, a, a, a list of places, like these actual Java objects. Now we need to do the opposite. We need to take those Java objects and convert them into a string because what we transmit over the internet are essentially strings. You can think of the internet as a big complex system for moving data around. A lot of times that data is in the format of a string. So we can actually, uh, is my app still running here? Let's see. Um, so I think it is. I'm gonna open up my, my emulator to make sure. Uh, where did the emulator go? There it is. Okay, so the app's still running. Um, I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna do this. And I'll explain this in a second. Um, oh, this is gonna like that. I'm trying to look at what the what the default port is here that I'm using. Uh, it is, oh right, okay, so it's running in the emulator. Sorry, so I, I can't actually do this. I always try to do this every year and then I realize, oh, I can't do it, it's too bad. Um, what I wanted to show you is you can actually request this, You if you could run a browser, um, and maybe we should do that actually, let's see here. Um, if I can turn this off. I run this browser, I hit accept and continue. Okay, I'm running Chrome, no thanks. Um, and what I want to do here, I don't know why this is so slow, is, oh, looks like it crashed on me. What I want to do is use this to actually, oh, come on. Okay. I'm going to do local host 8989. Eight, nine. And will this work? That's our question. Uh, and it says CS124. Okay, good, it did work. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna request places. So this is essentially what your app is doing when it starts up. It's making this request. Now it's not doing it in a browser, it's doing it using a library that also supports the same protocol. But what you can see happens is when I make this request using the browser that's part of it's kind of cool I was able to do this. Okay, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, when I, no, it's too big. Um, when I did this using this uh, browser that's built into the emulator, I'm actually getting data back. Now it's a little bit hard to see, but this data is in a different format that's called JSON. And there's more information about JSON that's included on this lesson. So I'm not gonna talk about it in a lot of detail, but JSON is a different way of taking data and serializing it. So. JSON is different than CSV. I prefer it to CSV. It allows you to express more complex data that you can fit into a CSV. Um, there's a lot of data out in the world that is stored in CSV format, but in general, JSON is a lot more powerful and a lot more widely used for this type of data exchange. So this is what, so essentially when I run that, this code right here, and if I wanted to, I could put, uh, put some logging in, but what's happening here is the dispatch method is running. It's seeing that I'm trying to get this route that's called places. It's coming into this get places method. And this is serializing. Now I'm using a library called Jackson, which again, we'll talk a little bit about as part of the lesson to take that list of places that exists in memory and convert it into a string. So that's what gets sent from the client to, sorry, from the server to the client. The client says, hey, I know you have some data about places. The server says, here it is, and passes back this JSON string. Now, let's go up a level. Now we're gonna talk about the client. So now we're in this file called client.java. Now we're in the app. So we're talking about the server up until now. Now we're in the app. So what made this request in the first place was this method called get places. Get places makes an HTTP request to the server, and there's a lot of commentary in here, so um, I won't talk in detail about this. Uh, it uses this URL places, it's the same one that I just used in Chrome, but it makes this as part of this application. When it receives a result, it uses Jackson, again, the serialization library that we'll talk, the lesson has more details about, to take that string and convert it back into a list of places. So the server has a list of places in memory. It converts it to a string, sends it over the internet to the client. The client then takes that string and converts it back into a list of places in memory. Now, how, do that list, how does that list of places get back to the main activity? We'll talk a little bit more about networking callbacks when we talk about MP2. But essentially what happens is when the main activity starts up, let's see, I'm gonna go to the startup code. 
So when the main activity starts up, yeah, on resume, it calls get places. Get places goes out to the server, makes the request, receives the string, deserializes it into a list of places, and then passes it to this method called accept. And this then updates the list of shown places in the UI. Um, so let's do one more little piece of logging here just for fun. Uh, so you'll see here that um, when after the request completes, what I get back is actually a string. So what I'm going to do, let's do log.i and we'll do the tag and we'll say um, response. So I just showed you when I go to this URL over here, I get this string back, right, that contains this JSON. I want to show you this is the exactly same string that the client receives from the server. And so let me rerun the app. That's okay. Uh, get out my system.out and I need to look at, let's see, client.java. And you'll see down here, and it's not very well formatted uh, because there are no line breaks, but this is JSON. This is the same string that we saw in Chrome when we asked for the same data from the server. Now, the cool thing about this is that for a normal application, what would happen is, let's say later today, I ask for the list of places again, I might get some new data. Every time I make that request, the server is allowed to provide me with a new set of places. So maybe somebody removes a place, maybe somebody adds a place, um, that comes back in this, in this flow. Okay, so I know this has been a lot to take in. I wanna just do a quick summary and then we're gonna wrap up. So what we talked about in this walkthrough is data flow. Uh, we looked at where the data comes from. We provided data to you in CSV format in a file that was included as part of the starter code for the project. We then talked about how the server loads this data into a list of place objects. So it does deserialization. It takes a string of data from a file and converts it into these Java objects that live in memory. When the server is asked for data over the internet, it performs the opposite task of taking the list of places and serializing it to a string. But instead of using CSV, it uses a different serialization format called JSON that is much more commonly used when exchanging data between servers and clients across the internet. The client takes that JSON string and again, so you know, it's like back and forth between list of places and a string, a string and list of places. So we start with a string, we convert it to a list of places, the server converts it back to a string, sends it to the internet, the client receives a string, converts it back to a list of places and passes that to our update markers method, which uses it to update the UI. Now you might be thinking like, this is so complicated, like why do I need to do all this? But here's the thing to keep in mind. When I send data over the internet, I have to send it in these very simple forms. I can't like send a reference to a list of places that lives in server memory to a client that is running on a completely different machine. So this idea of data interchange and serialization becomes incredibly important because whenever a client and a server wanna communicate, whenever they wanna send data back and forth, they need to agree on how the data is going to be structured and how it's going to be serialized. So essentially we've set up JSON as a serialization format for this app and we'll continue to use that in the future when we work on MP2. Okay, so now your task is, as you review these steps, keep your eye out for a place where we're losing the description. The description is in the places.csv. You can see it here. Every one of these places has a description, but somewhere along the way it's getting dropped. And your job is to find it, fix it, and when you're done, not only will the test work, the first test for MP1, but these info windows will also start to work, which is kind of cool. So good luck with that. If you need help, you know where to find us.